I would now like to introduce our first expert discussion of the day titled Designing for the New Reality. Why technology needs to be people-centric? Continuous tech innovation and staying relevant has become even more imperative in today's unprecedented times. Hear from the industry leaders on future growth and success through people-centric innovation. To tell us more, I would like to invite the chair for the next session, the lovely Supriya Danda, Vice President and Country Manager of Western Digital India on stage. Supriya is Vice President and Country Manager of WD India. She leads India's strategic charter and its expansion, key customer relationships, government relations, sustained growth of research and development capability, and serves as a spokesperson for the corporate brand in India. Supriya's fusion of business acumen, strategy, and organizational development has driven high performance culture and strong growth for the India region. Over to you, Supriya. <laughs> Thank you, Shreya. Very happy to be here at the NTLF 2021 and very interesting topic of discussion, designing for the new reality and why technology needs to be people-centric. When we look around, we realize and we see that technology is really dominating our lives today. And businesses are using this. They are weaving this intricately into their business model, processes, products, solutions, and offerings. Technology is becoming overpowering. And wherever we see, it's kind of taking over our lives. The way we work, the way we are at home, the way we connect, the way we communicate. We are rapidly changing and evolving in our use and demand of technology. When you look at research, they are saying the enterprises now really need to reorient themselves and rather swiftly so that they understand this new and highly symbiotic relationship that has developed over the years between humans and technology. We as customers, consumers of technology now have high, very high expectations. We are enjoying these new technology products, offerings, and perhaps we are asking for a little bit more. We want a little bit more control, more creative license, opportunity to collaborate, and perhaps you're asking that this entire ecosystem, which is kind of closed, it needs to open up. For enterprises thus, continuous tech innovation is an imperative, one that is absolutely something that they need to work on today. And with experience and impact being at the core of this innovation, it is asking companies to think differently, asking them to reorient their design as they think of a more human-centered approach with people at the center. We are looking at a lot more new initiatives come, a lot more new different ideas, trends as hyper automation, internet of behaviors, total experience strategy, privacy enhancing computation, and I can go on and on, but businesses are being forced. They are being challenged to look at their existing models differently, put on a new creative and a different lens and design something, create something which is new and one that is human centered. And it's based on principles of trust, ethical use of data, and enriching more immersive and deeper experiences with consumers, customers at the heart. Let's hear more from industry leaders on why technology needs to be people-centric as we ready ourselves to design for the new reality that's already knocking at our door. It's indeed my honor to introduce an especially impressive and eclectic panel who are dear experts in this area on a very contemporary topic of discussion. Please join me all in welcoming Cynthia Stoddard, SVP and CIO Adobe. Cynthia, if you can have you on. Welcome, Cynthia. Let me take a moment to introduce Cynthia. She's the Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer of Adobe. Cynthia oversees Adobe's global information technology and reliability engineering teams. In her leadership role, Cynthia spearheads a global strategy for delivering services and operations, and thus forms the mission-critical backbone of the company. She has 25 years of business experience and IT expertise leading large global organizations, including Adobe, NetApp, Safeway, and APA Limited, in functions as supply chain, retail, and technology development. Cynthia is a proud recipient of the CIO 100 Award 
in 2017 and 2018 for Adobe IT's innovative ways to deliver business value. And she was also named a CIO Hall of Fame inductee in 2019. Well, that is absolutely fabulous. She holds mm-hmm. a BS degree in accounting from Western New England University and an MBA from Merrillhurst University. Cynthia, what a pleasure to have you on the panel here. Welcome. Thank you. While we have Cynthia, I'm going to take a moment to introduce our co-panelist, Sridhar Solur, Chief Product Officer and General Manager, Mobile Robotics, Berkshire Gray. Sridhar, thank you so much and welcome to the session. I'm going to take a few moments to introduce you. Sridhar Solur is a serial entrepreneur. I'm sure you've heard this terminology. Business and technology leader with consistent track record of incubating, building, growing and managing businesses in large organizations in a worldwide capacity. He's product creator and a technologist with a razor sharp focus on user experience, focus on robotics, IoT, and AI-based industry products. His highly effective people management abilities are absolutely something that the industry talks about. Companies love it dearly, and he has seasoned abilities in how to recruit, develop, and lead high-impact cross geography teams focused on innovation and startup ventures. Sridhar Sridhar is the founder of HP's Wearables and Cloud cloud mobile print business, mobile IoT incubator, created and engineered by HPS and supported wearables, IoT products for consumer lifestyle brands like Hugo, Hugo Boss, Coach, Titan, and many others. He's been the former head of all products and engineering for digital home at Comcast, chief product officer, EVP GM at Shark Ninja, working on appliances, food tech, and robotics. He's a board member at IOTC, head of business, and led the creation of Shark's first advanced navigation robot. Well, that's impressive. He's been a mentor to 500 startups in the Alchemist Enterprise Accelerator. What an impressive, impressive series of accomplishments. Thank you so much for being a part of this panel, Sridhar. Welcome once again. Glad to be here. Well, let's get the dialogue started. Um, Cynthia, my first um, question is going to be to you. Um, When we talk about Adobe, Adobe Systems and Information Age have been perfect partners for close to 40 years and more. And what a stellar record financial performance that has been unveiled in the last quarter and the financial year that's gone by. When we talk about Adobe, we talk about game-changing innovations that are redefining the possibilities of digital experiences. I absolutely love the word possibility because at Western Digital, we talk about exploring possibilities of data. It's really something close to my heart. So there is this great you know, acronym, which is all about development approach, CARE, C-A-R-E. We talk about it, Adobe, and many other interesting things, Cynthia. Take us a moment and you know, walk us through what is so special at Adobe in their DNA that you know, it becomes the indispensable choice of all consumers. Thank you, thank you for having me. I love to talk about uh, Adobe. I think, um, you know, when I think about your question, the first thing that I'm going to mention is that, you know, at Adobe, we believe that innovation can come from any place in the company. And I think that's, you know, a core part of our DNA that really helps us be who we are, helps us with our products and, you know, helps everything that we, we do, you know, for our customers. I would also say that we keep the customer and the employee experience at the forefront of Adobe. And we leverage human-centered frameworks, such as CARE, which you mentioned, and I'll talk about a little bit, and you know what we call the Infuse framework, which is a framework that we've put together for my organization. At Adobe, we've always strived to uphold a human-centered approach and culture. Uh, for me and my team, that translates to keeping both the customers and employees at the forefront of our strategy and decision-making and driving those enhanced experiences. We, we push this out through all of my organization, the IT organization, and it has an impact on the rest of Adobe. You know, given the power and the proven correlation between happy employees, satisfied customers, and overall business success, I think it's more critical than ever that companies prioritize you know, frameworks, whatever they choose to call them, or business processes that take a human-centered approach. You know, as you mentioned, our you know, Adobe campaign, which is one of our products, um, leverages a development framework called CARE. Now, this is an acronym uh, that helps us to uh, remind us to take a human-centered approach and place that customer experience at the forefront of what we do. 
so that we can deliver really great software. And if you're wondering what CARE stands for, C is customer needs to drive all of your work. So focus on the why instead of the what. A is all about adoption, you know, the paths and how you require to plan or plan for that and the steps that you need to get there. R is recognize that the happiest scenario is not always there. You have to think about you know, those unhappy points and deal with them. And E is enable the teams that support your customers to be able to take care of them. You know, as a as a organization, I've mentioned that we leverage human centered framework, um, and it's called Infuse, and it's a product delivery framework based on design thinking and user experience to drive a more holistic approach. You know, Infuse allows us our teams to actually move away from project centered work and really look at it more from a product holistic view. Um, it's all about discovering, you know, looking at the root cause of the problem and listening and learning and trying to understand what is important to the users and whoever those stakeholders are. And then defining, you know, using brainstorming opportunities to prioritize them into a strategic roadmap, you know, and analyzing data. So using data to make your decisions and making sure that you're solving the problems that you've discovered. And then design. Design is um, about you know, looking at ideating and prototyping and testing and making sure that what you're doing works. So not just taking it for granted and going through the whole cycle, but saying, let's take a piece and let's test it out and see if it works or it doesn't work. And then delivery, this, the team coming together to build a solution, you know, and not doing it in a very much of a waterfall way, but doing it in sprints. So again, you can test and react to changes and look at that experience and see if you're having the impact. So we've done this internally. We've used it you know, on our um, uh, virtual learning systems that you know, have become extremely important during our lockdown and COVID. And actually we're going to use it as well to, um, to look at the future of work um, and you know, how do we design for the future of work and people coming back into the workplace. Awesome, Cynthia, and a good luck with that. We're all going to wait with weighted breath as to what future of work is going to hold for all of us. But, you know, I mean, you spoke about internal, you know, employees being happy and make for happy customers. Fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing that. And also, I love the point that listening into your pain problems of your customers and then working around them to fix them. And Shri, that that gives me a wonderful segue to my question to you, which is, you know, we all know what pandemic has done to us and the world. You know, the entire, you know, you know, and I know Berkshire stands for solving real problems from customers. And, and it's so beautiful when you read about more about the firm, it says, you know, many engineers can spend a lifetime not working on something so concrete and real life impact. But this is what your company stands for. And when you look at the lockdown online shoppers, you know, they've all experienced this huge, you know, delivery delays, time slots being, you know, going for a tizzy. And, you know, there was a time when we said that the infrastructure of retail did not perhaps prepare for this to entirely move online. And there is this entire phrase of last mile fulfillment. And that's where AI powered robotics of the Berkshire Gray come in. So talk to us a little bit about how you have used, you know, this innovation in a rapidly changing environment and actually solve the customer's problems. Thank you for the question, Supriya. I think last year has been surreal. If not for technology, the situation would have been so much different. Let me give you the magnitude of the problem. If you were to take e-commerce from May of last year to September of last year, let's take all revenue from e-commerce from May to September of last year. That was greater than all e-commerce revenues 10 years prior put together. Wow. That is an exponential ramp up. That's a phenomenally exponential ramp up. And retailers were struggling to take care of their customers. You know, care is amazing, but there is a customer pain point there, a consumer pain point where there is this exponential demand but all the systems that have been designed so far is based on linear thinking. And the beauty is the world of robotics stepped in 
and stepped in big time. Let me give you one example. What took off in addition to e-commerce is something like called the curbside pickup. Basically, you order, then you drive by the store and someone basically keeps your groceries or your shopping outside and, and, and you just pick up and go in. So when Cynthia or Supriya basically shops for a curbside pickup, there is a proxy shopper who goes in at 2 a.m. to do your shopping from the store or the distribution center basically has to shop on your behalf and that has to be magically transported store side. And if a store, a big retailer had one truckload, a 53 footer coming each day, now the demand was so high, they needed three truckloads a day. Three, from one to three. Let's just break this problem down. It takes usually 30 to 40 hours to unload a truck, man hours to unload a truck. So you, you take anything that is floor loaded in a truck, you put it back of the store, and then you quickly go from back of the store onto the aisle. It's a two-step process, 30 to 40 plus man hours. Now, three times a day, that's a huge problem. With COVID, you can't be close to people. So mm -hmm. what we did is robots did the work upstream of the distribution center so that anything that gets picked up from the truck, let's say the first pallet that comes in, top of the pallet goes to aisle number one, right at the top, you know, at the end of aisle number one. This is called aisle ready. Humans cannot do this. It was robots that actually stepped up to take care of the demand. So that's just one of the hundred examples where robots have stepped up. Summary is the last 12 months has been surreal. And you know, I'm, I'm very happy to say that working in the world of robotics, we've had the opportunity to let technology do the work for us in a much safer environment to take care of the consumer demand. Awesome, awesome, Sridhar. Just love the passion, you know, and the way that the company is solving it. And thank you so much. And you're right, you know, I think a lot, none of this would have been achieved without the AI robotics and your company stepping in. Thank you for this, uh, sharing that. Um, Cynthia, I'm going to come back to you now. We're talking about, you know, how we're using data, you know, to personalize this total experiences. And, and you, know, uh, you know, you talk about Adobe, you've got talk about any application out there and you know that there are these lovers of it which who cannot move from here to anything else. And when you talk about some of the Adobe consumers, the fans of the products and the offerings that you have, they say, you know, once in a while, perhaps we go out, flirt a little, but then we come back and we stick to what Adobe has, be it your Photoshop, Illustrator, you know, your new creative cloud or whatever you say that you have that you're putting as offering out there. So what is it about? How do you have this deep insight into what consumers want, what your customers want. And, and I realize there is this data-driven operating model that you are so passionate about. And as a leader, um, you know, the more we know about you, we know that it's all about data and metrics and that makes your world go, you know, completely, you know, interesting and in different directions. Talk to us about this DDOM and that has been deployed by Adobe, you know, in this wonderful insights that they use and, you know, drive the businesses from there. Yes, thank you. That's a great question. I do love talking about it. The first thing I'll say that um, it starts with empathy. And that might be, you know, a strange way to start talking about, you know, the answering the question that you just asked. But it's really, you know, taking the outside in view of that customer. And that's what, you know, DDOM allows us to do. It gives us a holistic view of that customer journey. And it allows us to react proactively and, you know, what by identifying pain points, you know, improving their experience and also, you know, building reliability and resiliency in where we need to. We've also taken the approach and, you know, we've uh, used it internally for employee journey mapping. So it's something that, you know, can be used across the board to look at journey, look at pain points. Um, I'm sure it could even be used to, you know, look at, you know, some of the processes that that you know, Sridhar put in with the robots, which is you know very very interesting to look for you know pain points along the way there. So you know we transformed from a desktop to cloud-based software a while ago, 
And yet we disrupted the entire paradigm for how we engaged and managed you know, enterprise data when we were doing that. If you think back in time when we used to sell box software, we didn't know who our customers were, right? We sold it to a third party, they distributed it, and that's all we knew. We knew it was used, but we didn't know much about our customers. But having our customers you know, and our software be cloud enabled, this allowed us to look at data at scale and reimagine how we harness, how we manage, and how we action this data. So you know, when we had all this data, we actually didn't have the right processes, KPI, or architecture put in place to look at that data. And that's what DDOM is all about. We were spending our time wrangling and managing data from different silos and disparate data lakes. You know, we had inconsistent data models across the company. We had to reconcile different sources of truth. You know, reporting was very fragmented. So what we did is we brought this all together. You know, we started small with a different, you know, a few different groups of the business, and we were able to focus. You know, really focus on um, bringing that disparate data together. Focus on bringing the inconsistent KPIs we had across the company to under forty was actually just around 15 being those key drivers for the business. And this focused on all the stages of you know, the customer journey. You know, we have six trillion roll, rows of data that we've been managing and we brought it all down to these 15 different metrics. So we've democratized it. We have a holistic view of the customer. We're able, you asked about you know, how do, we, how do we, you know, we stay in touch? We know the problems they're having in product. We can put in product help. You know, we can help guide them to use other features. So this is what, how DDOM allows us to really look at that journey proactively and you know, look at trends before they become issues and look at making our products, our services, and our systems more reliable. And again, taking the same concepts and then using them internally to, internally to look at the uh, employee journey so we can make the same you know, adjustments and you know, improve that employee journey like we did with our customer journey. Cynthia, this is fascinating, shining example of those who are out there and looking at how data strategy can be there, you know, deployed and put into action to drive real business value. I'm just gonna stay with you a bit longer and say, is if there was one or two challenges that you as a company, as an executive team encountered while implementing DDOM, what would they be? Just one or two top, top of the mind and how did you uh, work with them and kind of you know, emerge as a winner? So um, yes, I would say the first one when you embark on these, it's um, very natural to try to boil the ocean and do everything at once. And um, you know, what you really need to do is start small, right? start small and then get those metrics understood and then get people who are the stakeholders on board. So I think that, you know, the two lessons learned that I would, you know, say to everybody is start small, you know, pick a few groups that have um, metrics that, you know, are disparate and they really need them to manage the business and get them on board. And then spend a lot of time, again, understanding that customer journey and, you know, what is important to the customer you know, putting yourselves in the customer's shoes and really taking that outside in view as opposed to inside out. I'll just add, you know, one thing about the inside versus the outside, because I think it, it fits with uh, some of the questioning that, that you've been, you know, asking both of us, is many of our processes have been designed for efficiency of the processes. They haven't been designed for, you know, that customer experience. And I think last year, to Sridhar's point, we had to look at things much differently. And doing that, you had to put yourself in the view of the customer and the challenges and the specific challenges they were having happening. And doing that, I think you can apply technology in many different ways. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. And I think for all the consumers who are tuning in and listening, well, this is how companies are shifting, transforming processes completely. You know, it's a shift in the thinking and then reimagining, you know, how you put the consumer at the heart. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Sridhar, I'm going to come to you with a similar thing. I mean, we have this anecdote we want, I'd love to share. The word robot, you know, interestingly, I was reading about it. Well, that's now hit its 100-year usage in terms of anniversary. So that's fascinating. And, you know, there is enough and more that's being written that 2021 is going to be the year of the robots. 
Well, congratulations to you and the team at Berkshire Gray because there's going to be fascinating, you know, new upsides to how this is turning around. And as much as you delve into it, you realize service robots are perhaps going to be even higher in numbers in terms of revenue and usage, perhaps than the industrial robots that we are used to seeing. So that is one piece of information that I'd like you to comment on as to what the world of robotics is going to see. But if while you're answering that, you can quickly touch upon your passion area when you so passionately talk about how the physical and digital boundaries are kind of collapsing, they're blurring, you know, the asset heavy heavy is going to move to access heavy. So touch upon that a little bit, what your philosophy is and how you, the guru of technology, are predicting something new that's going to happen in the wave in the future of technology. So a little bit loaded here. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So um, oh. you said 100 years. So let's take 100 years. In the last 100 years, we did an analysis of all the recessions. There was one, the Great Depression that happened, you know, you're talking in, in the late 20s. There was one that happened in the 50s. That's the second one. Um, the third one was uh, the early 2000s, right? There was a recession there. We, we all know what happened there. And then you have the 2008 recession. That's the fourth one. And the fifth one is where we are right now. So what we did was we looked at all the patterns of technology that have taken off, right? Companies and industries that have basically like tanked and new companies that have actually taken off. And we have looked into some of the patterns with the last five recessions. And the beauty is, let's just look at the last three recessions. You know, our lifetime is perhaps uh, a, a good analysis. So in the year 2000, when we had the recession after 2001, you know, the thing that I want to highlight is there were 300 million devices connected to the internet. Bear with me here. In 2008, it was the mobile, there were 3 billion devices connected to the internet. There is a 10X. Here we are today, the next recession, there are 30 billion devices connected to the internet. How eerie is that pattern? Peter Diamantis talks about a 10x change. Anytime there is a 10x change, you can actually see three things that happen. One, you know, there is a major shift. Think of this as like the magical portal that you go through. When you, anytime you go through this portal of recession, two things happen. Technologies that are taking off, get, they completely accelerate. Look at what happened to e-commerce, right? After the last recession in, uh, with, with the mobile world and now where we are, right? That has taken off. Look at companies that have tanked. Take companies like Sears, you know, it went down, it went much down, you know, after the, uh, the, the, the previous, the last 12 months. Long story short is when the world of robotics in, in the last hundred years, what we have seen is even in the last three recessions, robotics has slightly started to take off. And the last recession, it just went all the way up. But let me go back to your specific question on service robots. I think there is something that Cynthia pointed out that is very important with the customers. The word, I think for this discussion is gonna be all about empathy. And you will see that service robots are entering a space where the man-machine interaction, right? It, it, it used to be people-to-people -people interaction. Look at what we what happened with the sharing economy in the previous after the previous recession. You know the the WeWorks, uh, the Airbnbs, all coming together, right? Uh, which was asset light, access heavy. Now we are in a situation. We are moving from people to people interaction to people to machine interaction. And we are trying to imbue more and more empathy uh, with the machine interaction. The human machine interfaces are getting awesome. more you know, like empathy at this point in time. So you're talking about digital experiences. I think you will see a lot of empathy in, in, in the people to machine interaction going further. 
Awesome. Am I blessed to have both my panelists resonate so beautifully on the word empathy and that's keeping customers at the heart and, you know, really looking at their pain problems. We're going to conclude in a short while. I just want to get you a quick one minute bite. Uh, Sridhar, I'm going to stay with you to say from Bangalore, right? And there's a little bit of a connect. I'm going to ask for that little pull at the target, the heart to say, what's your message on technology and leadership? If there's one quick nugget that you'd love to share for all the viewers on the NTL of 2021, what would that be? Yeah, I think any company, any technology, any product, any human interaction, never take more than you can give. I know being from Bangalore, I want to highlight how my, my parents are involved and in working with an orphanage. So the point is, how can technology enable, empower all those blind kids who are in that orphanage? So the point is, Empathy plays a big role and focus on that. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Sridhar. Cynthia, a quick, like a quick 30 second touch upon how at Adobe, you know, you're talking about touching the lives, you know, looking at technology to reduce this, you know, to kind of come forward and help the education and remove this digital divide. A quick 30 seconds comment from you on that. Absolutely. I mean, we have partnerships. One of the partnerships that we have is with NASCOM and thank you. And that we've joined hands to really help with skilling and reskilling to the students and professionals to orient them to the latest technologies and tools. And you know, this is helping with specific industry demand. So I think the message there is to keep learning, um, you know, experiment, try new things out because the technology is there, either the access to technology is there and it's just gonna help make the world better. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Thank you so much, Sridhar. You know, it's just interesting to have you here and thank you so much for your time. We are hearing the word empathy. We are looking at this entire world needing a lot more of that. So I think keep empathy at the core of your innovation. Keep empathy in mind when you're looking at solving your customers' pain problems. It's another way of saying put yourself in their shoes or stilettos, whatever the deal may be, I would say. But it's extremely important to get that going. So the question here is, opportunities are knocking at your door. The future clearly lies in inviting your consumers, your customers to your world of design and co-create, co-think with them at the heart. Good luck to you as you pioneer these new transformation, this change that you bring about in your processes and business models. And may this world would be a lot more empathetic with consumers and customers at the heart. Thank you so much for a wonderful, absolutely energizing and very, very high learning conversation. Thank you so much, India. Thank you, Sridhar, for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Supriya, Cynthia, and Sridhar. The conversation brings up some really relevant tracks. Innovation can come from anywhere in the organization. Infuse framework of the customer and employees at the forefront surely pays off. And the best example of linear thinking to exponential was best exemplified by the e-commerce last year in the period of May to September. And the expansive realm of possibilities was influenced by the symbiotic relationships between technology and humans. Uh, empathy was the keyword that she left us with.